how many of you noticed that gas prices are still pretty high? Did you did y'all notice that? Um, so as part of, of being your pastor, I love not just helping you spiritually, but I love helping you in really practical ways uh, as well. And so I discovered some really cheap gas this week, and I wanted to share this with you so that you could take advantage, okay? Um, you're, I'm going to tell you, you're not going to believe me, but it's true. I found gas this week for $1.39. $1.39. So are you ready? Because I'm going to tell you where to go. You can get $1.39 gas, and you can just text me later this week and be like, Pastor, now I know you really love me. Thank you for sharing this little tip. So pro tip, $1.39 gas. Here's where you get it. Are you ready? Taco Bell. Uh, so Pastor Tyler actually likes Taco Bell. Does anyone else like Taco Bell? I actually, I bought some gift certificates. Come, come up here. Come here. I, got, I have a Taco Bell gift certificate for you. Yeah, come here. Um, don't text me this week about your gas, though. I, I don't need to know about it. Who else? I, I got a couple more. Come, Bernadette, come up here. Uh, oh, was, Jen, were you waving your hand? Do you like Taco Bell? Okay, deliver this one to her because she's right behind you. Hey, nope. Nope. Legit, I gave Pastor Tyler a $100 gift card for his birthday this year to Taco Bell. It was gone like that week. I mean, they just, they splurged, all right? Um, so... <laughs> Was that a good joke or no? Uh, so just so you know, my middle daughter, Ava, told me that one, okay? We've been in a series called We, and uh, it's about these, these we statements, like who we are as Harvest, who we are, what we do. They're, they're these defining statements, and for each one, we're, we're not just t- like telling you it. We're taking several weeks to unpack it and really talk about it, and I've been giving you some homework, and we're kind of plugging it into our lives and trying to, trying to, to, to really you know, not just, just hear about it, but make it who we are. And the one we've been talking about, which by the way, Next week will be our last one, then we'll move on to the second we statement. The one we've been talking about is this, it's we don't do life alone. How many of you are beginning to believe that? Are any of you beginning to believe? Like, what it is, we're saying we value community. We value having the right friends. We don't want to do life in isolation. We don't want to to, to just go through this life and, and not be, you know, integrated into community. We want to do life alone. There's some things in life that I think are better together, okay? See, see if you, you, you agree. See if you can help me with this, okay? Things that are better together, okay? Peanut butter and jelly, jelly right? Somebody said green chili. I don't know, right? <laughs> That's New Mexico. You put green chili with anything, right? Peanut butter and jelly is better together, okay? This is one of my favorites, Oreos and milk. milk. Oreos and milk. little pro tip. You can take a fork, you can put it into the Oreo, into the frosting, and you can dip it in the milk. If you've ever wondered, how do I do this? That's how you do it right there, okay? Oreos and milk, better together. I almost won't even eat an Oreo without milk. I mean, that's just how much I believe in that, okay? You need to soften that up, okay? So Oreos and milk, things that go better together, ready? Gloves, right? Unless you're Michael Jackson, right? Because you need, you need two, right? Gloves. How about this? Anyone like fish and chips? Anyone? Fish and chips? Um, Two Fools Tavern, if you want to get the best fish and chips in Albuquerque, okay? Fish and chips. How, 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 about, how about burgers and fries? Anyone? Burgers and fries? Burgers and fries? Does anyone, I had a birthday this week, by the way. Um, does anyone else have a birthday in March? Who has a birthday in March? Kirk, you have, come up here. I have, I have a, a Red Robin gift card for you. You can go have some burgers and fries. Happy birthday. I didn't know, we didn't, I didn't know our birthdays were the same month. Give him a hand. Yeah, burgers and fries. Um, how, how about this? Uh, grilled cheese and tomato soup. In that, that's uh, that's a good combo right there. Right, dip the grilled cheese and tomato soup. Oh yeah, there we go. I, I have one more. Um, movies and popcorn. Movies and popcorn. Does anyone have an anniversary in in uh, what month are we in? March. Does anyone have an anniversary? Hands go up. Yes, I have. Does anyone have an anniversary in March? Anyone? Anyone? Tyler, you do? All right, here. I got three of these. So here, you you and Natalie can get movies and popcorn, or maybe that might not be enough. That might just buy popcorn. Um, Anyone else? Anyone else have an anniversary in March? Am I I missing anyone? All right, we'll go to April. Who has April? You're April? Is anyone else in April? You in April? Come here. I got three of these. Come on. All right, there we go. Yeah, there we go. 
Happy anniversary, y'all. Y'all get some popcorn and movie and a movie, maybe. All right, there we go. There's some things that are better together, right? You know what else is better together? You. You and your friends. You are better together. That's what this whole part of this series is about. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20 says this, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. Meaning, when, when you're with some wise people, when you're in community, you actually get, you're, you become more wise, right, by hanging out with the right friends. But the companion of fools will suffer harm. Meaning, but when you're friends with the wrong people, they're going to they're gonna drag you down. They're going to ca- actually cause harm to you. You might be tired of me saying it, but I'm going to say it one more time. You can't live the right life with the wrong friends. I want you to be in the right community. And today, I want to talk specifically about choosing the right friends. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26 says this. says, the righteous, that's you. Did you know that? You're the righteous. It says, the righteous choose their friends carefully. All right? They don't, just, they don't just go around like being, like they choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Here, here's what I love about friends. You are stuck with your family. You didn't get a choice, did you, right? Like, like God said, all right, here you go. These are your parents. These are your siblings. These are your grandparents. These are your cousins. And some of you are like, I don't like some of them. I, I know. You're stuck with them. But you know what's awesome about friends You get to choose them. You get to choose the people that you are going to do life with. And I just want to encourage you today to choose your friends wisely. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to ask you to pray with me one more time. And then we're going to really dig into how to choose the right friends. And and we do this most weeks. But this prayer has a really specific purpose. This prayer, I'm asking you to, to, to really position your heart to hear from God today. I believe that as we read God's word, it's living and it's active, that that, that God, through his Holy Spirit and through his word, will speak to each and every person in this room right now, not just on the topic we're talking about, but I believe he'll actually come into your heart and he'll begin to speak to you about exactly what you have been asking him about, because we're we're just in the right environment. How many of you believe that? All right, so will you pray this with me? It takes like 20 seconds, all right? Let's just pray. Father, we are getting ready to open the word. We ask that you would speak to us today. All across this room, we're all doing things right now. Just We're getting focused. We're, we're paying attention. We're, we're asking you. We're, we're, we're creating a receptiveness in our spirits to hear from you today. And my prayer is, Lord, that through your word and through your Holy Spirit, you would speak to each and every one of us today. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. Friendship is a two-way street. And today, I really want to focus on your part in this of choosing the right friends, okay? Owning your part of friendship begins with choosing the right friends. What does it mean when Proverbs says that the righteous choose their friends carefully? That's what I want to really talk about, choosing the right friends. Proverbs 12, 26, uh, in the New Living Translation, say, the godly give good advice to their friends. The wicked lead them astray. I'm just telling you, we go all through the Bible, and over and over, you're going to see how important it is to choose the right friends. How many of you have heard of the craze that's happening right now around these three letters, NFTs? How many of you have heard about NFTs, right? This, this is kind of a crazy thing happening right now. NFT stands for non Fungible tokens, okay? And, and this is just is taken the world by storm. Suddenly, we have an, an, a, an avalanche of digital art pieces, and it's blowing my mind because some of them are going for tens of millions of dollars. Have, have y'all seen this going on? You can't put your hands on it. It is digital, and you can own it for millions and millions of dollars. Did y'all know that this was going on? NFTs. You should look it up. It, it'll blow your mind. Let me, in fact, let me show you a couple. I have a couple. Okay? This first one is called The First 5,000 Days. Okay? This one's called The First 5,000 Days. It's not that impressive in this view, because let me tell you what's going on here. This piece was created by a digital artist and graphic designer, Mike Winkleman, also known, he's, he's got a, a name he goes by, also known as Beeble. 
He started, this is a collage that he started in May of 2007, and he posted a different piece to this every single day for 13 years. 13 years of a daily picture collage, and then he sold this as an NFT. You won't even believe how much it sold for, $69 million for that right there, digitally. You can't even hang it in your house. You just pull up your phone and be like, look at this, 69 million, right? I, I was kind of, I didn't really know how this stuff worked, so I, scra- I grabbed a screenshot of this and I sent it to Pastor Tyler, and I literally thought he was going to probably call me and be like, yeah, you can- we can't show that, right? Because it's, I-, I didn't know, like, it's a digital thing. I didn't know if I'd be able to, but he said I could. So if, if we get in trouble, he'll go to prison, not me, okay? Here's the second one. Check this one out. This is called the first tweet, okay? The first tweet. Jack Dorsey, CEO and founder of Twitter, auctioned off this, a picture of his first tweet for $2.9 million, and all it says is, just setting up my Twitter. Anyone anyone want to outbid $2.9 million today? Really, if you do, uh, I want to talk to you all in, so, okay, no. You want to see one more? Here's one more. This is called World Wide Web Source Code, okay? Uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the founder of the World Wide Web, sold this NFT that consisted of the original source code for the web. Its official title was, This Changes Everything, okay? Which it did, to be fair. It sold for $5.4 million, And an interesting side note is that within days of the sale, someone pointed out a coding error in the the artwork. Isn't that interesting? NFTs are, this is kind of a crazy phenomenon right now. Whether you understand them, whether you like them, whatever your opinion is on them, here's, here's what I think NFTs are proving is that scarcity drives value. Scarcity drives value. Can I just tell you that when you find a good friend, you've found something that's scarce, and therefore it is valuable. When you've found, I'm talking about a reliable, faithful, trustworthy, ride-or-die friend, okay? You have found something far more valuable, in my opinion, than any NFT, okay? It is scarcity drives value. Proverbs 20, verse 6 poses it like this. It says, many will say they are loyal friends, but who can find one that is truly reliable? How many of you have figured out that part of life? That there's some friends that they're like, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you, until it gets hard, and then you're looking around like, dude, where'd you go, right? Wow. Proverbs says, but a reliable friend, who can find I mean, I mean it's, this is a big, big deal. So, so just quickly, because uh, I want to focus more on the second part of this message. Quickly, what do you do when you find the right kind of friend? Okay? When, you're, when you've got the friend, a reliable friend, like Proverbs says, what do you do? Okay? Just, this is going to be super fast. Number one, thank God. <laughs> thank God. Uh, Paul writes uh, to his friends in Ephesians 1, 16, and he says, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. I might, I might add to this, don't just thank God, thank your friend. <laughs> like, I hope that during this series, and if, by the way, you haven't done it yet, you should do it today or this week, I hope that at some point in this series you've realized how awesome one of your friends are, and that you have called them, texted them, emailed them, mailed them, bought them lunch, coffee, something, just to say, you are an incredible friend, and I am so glad that you are in my life. What do you do when you find the right kind of friend? Number one, you thank God. Number two, guard it. Guard it. Protect it. Do whatever you need to do to keep this friendship intact. Fight for it. Don't let other people, you know, get in the way. Don't, don't let the enemy, you know, get, get in the middle and create a fence that, that, that would divide you. Guard that friendship. It's so worth it. Number three, study it. Study it. Ask yourself, why is this friendship working? What do I like about them? How could I replicate this in other relationships? Like, like, what am I really looking for in this friendship? Number four, keep it healthy with good habits. Keep it healthy with good habits. 
You know, cruise control is a wonderful feature in your vehicle. It's an awful feature in your relationships. You can't put your marriage on cruise control. I thought someone would say amen right there. You can't put your friendships on cruise control. Like, like you, you, I'm just telling you, cruise control is awesome when you're going down the highway and you don't want to think about it and you don't want to get a ticket and you don't want to worry about it. It's an incredible feature in our cars, but you can't do this in your relationships. You, you're going to have to work at the relationships. Listen, any relationship that's worth having is worth working on. You, you, you're gonna just, I'm just telling you, you're going to you're gonna have to put some healthy habits into your friendships. I just, just a quick list. Like, talk often. Be honest. Pray for each other. Hold each other accountable. Ask the hard questions. Love deeply. Like, like these are good habits that will keep a good relationship a good relationship. Number five, evaluate it regularly. Evaluate it. Take time to evaluate your, your friendship. At the beginning of each year, I, I teach on a, a theme verse that will guide us for the whole year. And almost every year, I, I use this analogy because I, I try to set up why are we talking about a theme verse. And it's because it, it's an anchor for our hearts for that year. And so I'll talk about this word, drift. And I'll almost always say this, drift happens naturally and quickly. Meaning if you're not paying attention... If you're not putting the work in, if you're not creating the momentum, if you're not creating the direction that drift, you'll just, you, you won't even notice that you're drifting and you'll drift off course. And this is what happens in friendships. This is what I'm telling you. Evaluate your friendships. Don't let the relationship just drift apart. I have a, I have a friend that he was actually one of my roommates in college and uh, I mean, we, were, we were really good friends. And some of you probably have friends like this. We, after college, we went two different directions, two different states, two different churches, two different, all this stuff. And, and really, you know, we, we kind of kept up on Facebook. And, and for a little while, you know, his, his home was off of a highway that was between here and Lisa's parents' house. And so sometimes we'd stop. But then it just, the gap got bigger and bigger and bigger. And like, I hadn't seen the guy in years and years and he texts me this week, and he's like, hey, I'm going to be in Albuquerque Sunday. Want to have lunch? And I'm just, I'm just telling you, I'm leaving after church to go on a hunting trip, and I am so excited, like out of my mind excited. The truck is packed. I am ready to go, and I'm going with some friends, right? And so, I, honest to God, this friend texts me. He's like, want to go to lunch? And I'm like, no, I want to go. I want to leave, and then I was so convicted because I've been preaching to you about having the right friends. And so I texted him back and I said, yes, yes, I will. Go. Let's go. Please, can we go have lunch? Because you know what happened to our friendship? No, nothing bad. We never got in a fight. We didn't get in a disagreement. Like, we just drifted, right? It's just what happens because friends, friendships take work. They require effort. It means you gotta, you got to call. you got to check in. you gotta, you got to show up. you got to be in people's lives. And I'm just telling you, evaluate your friendships so you know how they get there. Number six this is the last one in this part, and I'm going to switch gears completely. Nourish it. Nourish the friendship. What you feed will grow. You're going to you're gonna have to feed your friendship, water your friendship, fertilize your friendship. Proverbs says it this way, Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. It's this, it's this idea, this back and forth that we're nourishing each other, we're, we're helping each other, we're challenging one another. I'm just telling you, the right friend is so, so worth it. But what happens, I flew through that because here's where I want to talk to you today. What happens when we realize that we're in a toxic friendship? I, I've been saying in this series, I've been saying, hey, I hope you're evaluating your friendships. I, I've been challenging you. I've been, I've been so bold to say, some of you need some new friends. And, and some of you might be offended that I'm talking about some of your toxic friends. So today, if you've been offended, I want to just go a little bit further because I'm already there, okay? What, what happens when you have toxic friends, okay? Friendship should make you feel happy and strong, and confident. 
If you don't feel supported uh, or if the relationship drains you, then you're probably in an unhealthy relationship. In toxic friendships, there tends to be a lot of anxiety and sadness and stress. After you've been together, if you leave and you feel drained, or, or say they cancel plans and you feel a little bit relieved, like, oh, good, I don't have to go do that anymore, that is a sign that your friendship is in trouble, okay? I'm just trying to help you. These are signs. I'm trying to help you. A healthy friendship is two-sided. Both parties give and take. In a toxic friendship, it's very one-sided. One person feels a lot more invested than the other. Friends feel secure with one another. If you feel emotionally or physically unsafe in your friendship, run. (laughs) Get out of it. Ask for help. Find better friends. I've been encouraging you to evaluate your friendships. And I, I, now I just I want to speak as directly as I can to this because the Bible, I don't know if you know this or not, the Bible actually has a lot to say on this topic. Proverbs 22 verse 24 says, don't befriend angry people or associate with hot tempered people. Okay, I'm just going to show you a couple scriptures that are really clear, right? It says, Proverbs is saying, don't be friends with that angry, hot-headed, quick-tempered person, okay? Now, can I, can I see the hands of anybody who would say, Pastor, sometimes my anger gets the best of me? Anyone? I'm raising my hand with you just so you know, okay? Now, now let me just ask you, is there anyone that's thankful for the grace of God? Okay, yeah. Okay, listen to me. God can heal and restore. He can, take, he can help you. I mean, all these things are true, Okay. But Proverbs is saying this, it's saying, it's saying, don't be friends with someone who will not submit their anger to the Lord. Someone who's going to constantly use their anger against you as a weapon. Proverbs literally says, that's not the person, man or woman, that's not the person to be friends with. Here, here's another one, 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Okay, I don't know if we're at the last days, but I do know we're closer than we've ever been. And listen to this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. What a list, huh? Now watch this. This is so important. Watch the last sentence. Have nothing to do with such people. So I just, I just want you to know that today as I'm asking you to evaluate your friendships, you might be sitting there thinking, wow, pastor is being kind of harsh about this. What has he got against my friend? Nothing. I'm just reading the Bible. <laughs> the Bible clearly underlines this idea that you can't have the right life with the wrong friends. Simply put, we love everyone. Christ followers, we love everyone, but we don't let everyone have the access to us, the the, the friendship, the closeness, the ability to speak into our lives. We don't give everyone the same access. In fact, one of the things that will help you to safeguard is having the right boundaries, which, by the way, toxic friends will almost always ignore and blow past your boundaries. It's another sign that it's a toxic friend, is they won't won't respect the boundaries. And I just want to show you this quickly. Jesus actually had boundaries. I found several places. I'm just going to show you one. In Mark chapter 1, it says this. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place. I won't teach on this, but but this is a a healthy habit for you. And Jesus is modeling it. He's been very busy healing and preaching and doing all this stuff. And and here he sees his physical body wearing down. So he says, I'm going to get away to a solitary place to refresh my body and to refresh my soul. And while he's there, it says this. He's praying, it tells us. 
And Simon and his companions, or I might say Simon and his friends, right? Simon and his friends come looking for him. And when they found him, listen to this line, because you've probably heard it. They say, Jesus, everyone is looking for you. Don't you love when someone tells you that everyone is doing something? Everyone's doing this. Everyone's buying this. Everyone's going here. Everyone. I mean, it's just this, this not so subtle pressure, right? Like, like, come on. Why aren't you doing this? Simon, he, he means well. He really does. But he's a bit ambitious, right? And he comes to Jesus and says, everyone is looking for you. And isn't it amazing that when you think that others want you to do something, it's so easy to lower your your, your, your agenda, change your agenda, change your priorities, lower your standards, right? Because you feel this pressure like, well, gosh, I guess if everyone is going to this concert, if everyone is going to this movie, if everyone is spending their money this way, if everyone's going there, then maybe I should as well. Which, by the way, this is why we need boundaries. And watch what Jesus does. Verse 38, Jesus replies. So there's this pressure. Everyone's doing it. Jesus goes, well, let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages, so I can preach there. That is why I have come. So he traveled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, driving out demons. Here's what we see in this quick passage, is that Jesus didn't let someone else's emergency become his emergency. Toxic, listen, toxic friends will always have another emergency, and they want their emergency to be your emergency. They want you to bail them out. They want, you to, they want you to come to the rescue. They want you to pay the bill. They want you to, to leave your, your, your family dinner in the middle and come and, t- and, and take care of them. I'm just telling you. That, and, and if we're not careful, if we don't have boundaries, right? Here, here's what I see in Jesus. Jesus had already established a boundary. He knew his mission, and he stayed on target. You see, the right boundaries, they set limits on others, but really they set limits on ourselves. I don't know if you know this or not. Usually when we talk about boundaries, we feel like we're being fenced in and, and like, ah, oh, we kind of resist it. Boundaries are actually really freeing. It's, it's defining the area that you can live. Now, I love this verse. Jesus talked about how the devil comes to steal and kill and destroy, but Jesus said, I have come so that you may have life. And listen, biblical boundaries design a life that Jesus designed for you. It describes a life of full life. And the enemy wants you to think, if I just go over that fence, it's going to be a better life. And it's, I'm just telling you, it's the exact opposite. The boundary actually gives you freedom to enjoy the life that Jesus is dreaming for you. So in our friendships, we've we got right, we to have the right boundaries. Listen, you need boundaries in your friendship. Here, here's a couple of, of places specifically. You need boundaries when you feel overwhelmed by life. In fact, I might say boundaries are more important when you feel overwhelmed because when you feel overwhelmed, you're more apt to run and chase and look and try to find something that will help you because you feel so overwhelmed. And that's when you need boundaries to go, nope, this is how I'm going to live my life. I've got biblical boundaries in place. You need need biblical boundaries when your availability has changed. Here's what I mean. Um, When you move from a single person to a married person, you you now need new boundaries, right? When, when, When you go from married with no kids to married with kids, you need new boundaries. Like when there when there's these transitions in life, right? When when a sudden your availability has changed, that's a great place for you to readjust your boundaries. And then here's, here's the last one I'll tell you. You need boundaries when a relationship is too one-sided. When one person is constantly pushing, 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 you got to be the one that has the boundaries. By the way, there's a, a, a book recommendation. I've been making some book recommendations lately. I've probably given hundreds of this book away. It's literally called Boundaries. <laughs> Okay, it is the textbook. I'm just telling you, I've given it tons and tons of these away. If you're curious about this topic, I would just get that book and dive into that. Okay, here, here's some types of boundaries. I'm not gonna I'm, types of boundaries: physical boundaries, emotional, material, intellectual, spiritual, and time. You need to think through your life and and think through the boundaries that you need in place in all six of these areas, 
especially as it pertains to your friendships. How much time are you going to give them? How much, how much are you going to allow them to speak into your spiritual life? How, do you see what I'm saying? What, what are the physical boundaries? What are the emotional boundaries? You, you've got to define these. Proverbs actually tells us 16 kinds of people that we should not have as friends. I read a couple of them to you earlier. I, I won't show them all to you because we just don't have time today. But, but I encourage you, if you're, if you're interested in this idea of like, uh, there really are people that I should not be friends with. Just go through Proverbs and take note. Proverbs 14, 7, escape quickly from the company of fools. They're a waste of your time, a waste of your words. Proverbs 1, 10, my son, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. Proverbs 20, verse 19, a gossip goes around telling secrets. So don't hang out with those chatterers. <laughs> we could just keep going. I'm just telling you, Proverbs, literally a book of wisdom, and it will help you to see the relationships that you should not be a part of. So I'm going to give you this relational grid, okay? I heard a pastor teach on this uh, in my studies for this series, and it was so good. I thought, I'm like, I gotta, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this. Uh, this is so good. Here, here's a relational grid to help you looking at healthy uh, relationships versus unhealthy relationships. Okay, just a, I think there's six or six or seven, eight things. Eight things. They'll go quickly. Number one, relational grid. An unhealthy relationship is possessive. A healthy relationship is free. Unhealthy is possessive. Healthy is free. Questions. I won't do questions on everyone, but questions. Do they encourage me to spend time with others? If I don't call, do I get in trouble? Right. So I'm not a possessive friend, okay? I'm just, I'm just telling you, if it, what I'm hoping as I go through this grid is there's something that, that just a little thing in your heart's like, kind of like, I should look at that. I should check into this a little bit more, right? Okay, let me, get, let me give you another one. Unhealthy friends are jealous. Healthy friends are selfless. I'll just tell you a story. Lisa Flew out a couple of weeks ago to Dallas to go to a, a conference with a bunch of pastor's wives. And, and uh, she landed and she, we had rented her a car. And so, so I said, hey, once you get the car, just then call me just so I know everything's good. And so she, she calls me. And I said, hey, did you, you, know, you make it? Yeah, I made it. I got the car. And so we're just talking. And she's like, she's like Jason, you, you won't believe this. She said, I walked up to the guy at the counter that was checking me out. And I went, wait a second. There's a guy checking you out. I'm about to come to Dallas right now. I knew what she was saying, okay? She meant like running the cashier, the computer, like checking me out. Right, okay. But I just had to have some fun. I'm like, wait a second. Who is this guy? He ain't safe. I'm just telling you, all right? Can, can, I, can I just, I'll just tell you, I'm going to be honest. There was no fear whatsoever in my heart in that moment. I don't worry about my wife. I don't, I don't worry. I mean, part of it's because she lives with me and I'm pretty awesome. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> It's, it's because we've been married a long time. We've developed, there's, there's some healthy, like I trust her. I'm not, I'm not worried about, I wasn't jealous in that moment. <laughs> there, there, was a, there was a story where she'd actually been there about three weeks before, and it was the same guy that had checked her out the first time, <laughs> was checking her out again, right? Aww. So anyway, and a healthy relationship is, 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 not, is not jealous, it's selfless. Number three, unhealthy is controlling Healthy is encouraging. So by the way, you could run this, this grid through your marriage. You could run it through friendships. You could run it through work relationships. You can run it through all kinds of, okay, mainly I'm talking about friendships, but you might hear something that's like, wait a second, I should look at this, okay? Unhealthy is controlling. Healthy is encouraging. Unhealthy is rebellious. Healthy is accountable, Healthy people don't have a problem being accountable. Pick an area of, the, of their life. They don't have a problem being accountable because they're healthy. They're not hiding anything. They're not worried about anything. They'll share. They're, they're, they, they don't have to manipulate. They don't have to weave these lies. They don't have to, you see what I'm saying? This is how you figure out if your friendship's healthy or not. Okay? Uh, here's, here's a couple questions in this, in this category. What do those who want the best for me think about this relationship? So if you're, if you're a, a young person, right, if you're a teenager, you're still at home, what do my parents think? 
What does my youth pastor think? What does my pastor think? You should be concerned about that one. What does your pastor think? What, what, what do people that love me and want the best for my life, what do they think? Am I ignoring the advice of key people in my life? Because <coughs> if it's healthy, I don't mind being accountable. Number five, unhealthy is exclusive. Healthy is inclusive. Okay? Healthy is like, yeah, we can, let's invite some more. It's a cool, let's, let's, we can invite some friends, right? I'm not worried. We're good. We're good. Unhealthy is like, you are mine, and I control you, and I get all your time, and I'm the one, that, you, are you following me? So about if, I'm just telling you, if the radar is going off, please evaluate your friends. Number six, unhealthy, my relationship with God is weaker. Healthy, my relationship with God is getting stronger. That's a great way to figure out the kind of friends that you have. Are they, are they bringing you closer to Jesus, or are they causing you to go further away? Number seven, unhealthy is physically permissive. Healthy is sexually pure. If you have friends who are pressuring you to, be, to, to cross your boundaries physically, sexually, emotionally, just telling you it's the wrong kind of friend. Has, here's a question on this one. Has this relationship caused me to lower my standards? If so, please evaluate it. Please do something. Don't ignore it. Number eight, unhealthy is codependent. Healthy is whole, okay? Is this helping you? What do we do with toxic friendships? So, so here's just a list of things. Run if these things are in play, okay? Run if these things are in play. Real fast. I'm not going to expound on them, okay? Run if things, these things are in play. Run if your friend is not a Christian, okay? Now, now remember, okay? We love everyone. You got that? You got that? We love everyone. I'm talking about the people closest to you who are influencing you, who are giving you advice, who are speaking into your life. I'm just telling you, they need to be God-fearing, Bible-believing individuals. If not, they can't be part of that core. I'm just telling you. Or you're asking for trouble. Run. <laughs> I added this one. Run if my pastor doesn't like them. <laughs> but I'm actually serious. <laughs> Okay, me or Jace or Jerry or Tyler, like Lisa, especially Lisa. If Lisa doesn't like your friend, you're in trouble, okay? Because she likes everybody, <laughs> all right? What, what I'm saying, though, is every once in a while, someone who loves you and is close to you sees something that you don't see. That's kind of part of our role as pastors, as shepherds, right? Is every once in a while, I want to go, go get my shepherd's staff and like, mm, get what are you doing? Get out. That's what a shepherd did, did right? You wolf, you get out of here. Why are you being friends with them? They're part of my church, right? You see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm being really honest. Like if, if you show up with your friend and then one of your pastors is like, hey, what is that about? You, should, you, just, just, you, should, you should pay attention. What, run if they're trying to control you with threats. Run if they're trying to control you with sex. Run if your relationship is being weak with God is weakening. Run, run, run if you're sub subject to physical violence. Run if you're being verbally abused. And I'll just add this. If, if either of those are the case, r please run to me and I will help you. Okay? <laughs> we'll take care of that. Because we don't do life alone. Okay? We don't. We don't let that, we don't let that nonsense happen. Run if, if they're causing you to compromise. Run if, if you're sinning together. Have you ever noticed that, 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 that the wrong friends will, the, the, you start sinning more, right? It's like, hey, let's go do this. Hey, let's go do that. And it's hard to tell them no because you're a friend. I'm giving you permission to tell them no. I'm giving you permission to get a new friend. I'm giving you permission. If they're causing you to sin, if you're sinning together, I'm not blaming your friend. You're still making the decisions. But that's the wrong kind of friend. Run if they have addictive behaviors. Again, we believe in the grace of God. But I'm just saying, I'm trying to protect you. Run if you don't have God's peace. Isn't it crazy how often we just blow past the, the peace of God because it's something that we want? That, that, listen, the peace of God is a huge, huge radar for you on making a life decision, on joining a relationship, on all the, I mean, I'm just telling you, the peace of God is huge. And so often, if, if what's on the other side of that piece is something that our heart desires, we ignore it. 
We get to the other side, we're like, I wonder where the peace of God went. You just blew right past it. So what do you do? Here, five things. I've had, I've had a lot of points in this one. It's super practical. What do we do? What do you do if you find yourself in a toxic friendship? Okay? What do you do? Number one, admit it. It's often the hardest part. Maybe today you've realized, yeah, there's some people I don't need to be doing life with. It's okay. Start today by admitting it. Here's maybe the harder part. Go ahead and end it. Make that decision. Admitting it's half the battle. Now you've got to end it. I'm not going to do this. Abandon it. What I mean is don't go back. Don't leave a, don't leave a door open. Study it. How did I get here? I don't want to be back in another toxic relationship. I have, I have so many friends who have just gone from toxic relationship to toxic relationship to toxic relationship to toxic relationship. If you don't study it and figure out why you got there, you'll keep repeating the same mistake. So admit it, end it, abandon it, study it. Number five, don't duplicate it. <laughs> Stop going. Stop doing it. You are surrounded here by God-loving, God-fearing, Bible-believing, people-loving friends. You don't have to be in a toxic relationship. Why don't you stand with me? Can I just tell you something? I have felt for a few weeks like this was a topic that I needed to tackle with you. It's not the most exciting sermon in this series, but for a one or two or three or four of you, it might be the most life-changing. And I really mean this. If you need help in a toxic friendship, I'm here for you. In fact, all of our staff, all of us are here for you. Life's too short. You don't, have, you don't have to put up with it. You don't have to live in the, in, with the secret. By the way, by the way, some of you, if, if, you're, if you're identifying a toxic friendship right now, you're probably feeling guilty. And the next thing you'll feel is embarrassed. Please don't. Please don't feel embarrassed. The grace of God has come to you today to give you an escape route. The grace of God has come today to say, you don't have to live like this. There's, there's such a better life on the other side of this. Y'all, I just, I so want you to have the right friends. The right friends. Because I want you to live the life that God's been dreaming for you. So, I'm going to have our worship team lead us in one final song. I'd encourage you to spend these final minutes just, just listening for the voice of the Lord and and what he has for you. We, we prayed that earlier. Now this is often the time where the Holy Spirit comes and begins to seal the work that he's been doing you, in you this morning. And then I'll come back up and pray a, a final prayer. Worship team, lead us, please.